Welcome to Secondhand Sellers, where we talk thrifting, reselling, and all things secondhand. I'm Sarah. And I'm Clayton. Thanks for joining us again today. Um, so Clayton, today we're going to talk about something that you thought of. And so I'm a little at a loss. <laughs> so I'd love to hear your opinion on this. Tools of resale. Now we all know computers, cameras, or some iteration of that. Sometimes it's just a cell phone. Those are the tools of resale that we think of mm -hmm. as being core staple tools. But your argument here is that There's there are a lot other more. tools that we maybe don't initially think of, but that are still important. So I would like yeah. you to start this one. Cool. Um, what are these tools of resale that most of us overlook? So there are three tools I use on a very consistent basis. I have to factor into my cost and expenditures. And number one is Ziploc bags. I buy Ziploc, Ziploc bags. I buy Ziploc okay. bags. And after I list my items, they go into Ziplocs, depending on what they are. If they're, you know, small, they go into small ones, big ones, bigger items. It keeps my or my items organized. Keeps them dust free. I have a dog. Keeps dog hair off of them. I also have to buy lint rollers mm -hmm. because selling clothing, you have to lint roll every single item before you take pictures of it. Dog hair. And because I got a dog, sometimes I have to lint roll my items before they ship out because I bring them in and it's like, crap, they got dog hair on them. Right. You don't want to gross out your right. buyer. You, you want your, your buyer, your customer to get your item and be like, oh, wow, my item is nice and clean. You don't want them to go... Ah, oh, the item was nice, but it was covered in cat hair or yeah. whatever. Um, and so it's just one, two of those items I go, I buy on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Maybe not every month, but at least every other month I have to go buy another box of um, Ziploc bags or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then the other item I'm using so often is Clorox wipes. To clean things? Because mm -hmm. uh, I'll get stuff and it's like, it feels grimy, whether that's just because somebody yeah. somebody didn't take care of it, it sat in the garage, and I could go wet down paper towel, and I'll do that too. I'll wet down paper towel and I'll wipe something if I think Clorox wipes are going to be a little too harsh on it. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's like, man, I don't want this sucker clean. Yeah. <laughs> and buying some Clorox wipes and wiping stuff, it gets, you know, gets the grime gone. That makes sense. It's something that people don't even consider and they're using their own household goods or household purchases mm -hmm. and in therefore they're paying extra taxes on it instead of writing it off as their business expense if you have a business set up mm -hmm. that i just got to the point where i go it's something for my business i have my own business link roller my own business clorox mm -hmm. wipes and ziploc bags just because it keeps my finances separate and easier to manage. That's that's smart. It's a good idea. But, I never thought about it. A lot, usually for cleaning, we'll use just towel. Like towels, like obviously mm -hmm. we all have junk rags to clean with and yeah. stuff. Um, but if we are using paper towel, it would make sense to have a couple of rolls that we just use for our business. Mm -hmm. So I'll have to talk to Hannah about that because I didn't think about it. We, you know, it just depends on what we're cleaning. Because yeah. sometimes I'm cleaning glassware, which always clean your glassware. You would yeah. not believe what a glass, the difference between, even if it looks fairly clean, the difference if you just wash it and dry mm -hmm. it and how sparkly and beautiful it'll look on the photos. And same with, and that goes back to what I was saying. I even buy dish soap. I have a bottle of dish soap really? just for my business. Yeah, because at the end of the day, sense. I can write that off as my purchase. I'm going to have to talk to Hannah about that because that does make sense. Yeah. I might even think like Q-tips. Mm -hmm. I've used sometimes I've used Q-tips for small yep. small things. But getting in between like cracks of um, like gaming consoles or um, mm -hmm. small knickknacks. I actually have another one too that we've not bought specifically for our business, but I'm sure we've used it for the business. So we probably should think about buying a separate one. Mm -hmm. um, it's a product called Citrusol, and you have to be careful with it because it will damage certain types of plastics and things. So you do have to be kind of careful with what you're using it on. But it's great definitely on, on glass or ceramic for getting adhesives off. Oh. It's sort of an oily citrus-based product. Mm. Product, it smells nice. 
Um, a similar thing would be Goo Gone, something like yeah. that. I think that's a good tool of the trade. We mm-hmm. all have had the sticker war where we could not get that adhesive off. Yep. Or something that has maybe had an old piece of masking tape on it forever and just won't come off. Um, it makes a really quick, easy job of that, especially if you just you just put it on like a like a paper towel and yeah. it'll, it'll like melt it right off. Um, and I might say this is sort of a little bit different, but it, I mean it's in the same vein, but it's something else to think. A hair dryer mm-hmm. is also a good tool for getting hard to get off. Um, stickers, labels off of products, yeah. especially if it's a delicate item where putting a solvent or washing it might be a problem, like a book cover or something. That putting that hair dryer right up to it often like will melt the adhesive enough that you can pull it off without leaving lots of scraps and sticky behind. So, did you have any other like unique tools of resale that did get me thinking about like yeah, some yeah. of the other things that maybe we <laughs> use and don't don't even think about the fact that we're using them? Could be your vacuum cleaner. No, nah, I'm using anything like that. I'm using measuring tape all the time. Yep. Not not necessarily. There are some items I will measure out and take a picture with my measuring stick, actually showing the mm-hmm. dimensions of the yeah, item. Yeah, we've done that before. But more often, it's just to measure my own packages. Even though a lot of times I'll use pre-made um, poly bags mm-hmm. or um, bubble mailers that they're all the same size. But sometimes it's just like, man, I got to measure this just to You're put it, and it, sa- and it ends up saving extra money. And just having, um, I will say, a measuring stick is far easier to manage and use while taking pictures than it is to deal with the measuring tape, just mm-hmm. because measuring tape, they floop around everywhere. Mm-hmm. But A scale. A scale. If you are not using a scale... Use a scale. You can get a nice... Especially because the post office is picky. Yes. You can get a nice scale for cheap. It's like 20, 25 bucks. Mm-hmm. You or get less if you find it second hand. Less second hand, <laughs> always. <laughs> but you can get a nice scale for 25 bucks and it will save you hundreds of dollars. Because if you get the exact dimension of the item and weigh it, and I don't know about you, but I'll weigh my items with like a little bit extra weight wiggle room so, so you weigh them before you even list them i yeah well as i'm listing them i'll weigh my item okay. that way i know how much i need to charge my customer for shipping mm-hmm. and i don't weigh every item for example if i have an item i know is Something under really light yeah really super light. light i don't worry about the weight because i just use what ebay populates as because mid recommended weight or heavy items mm-hmm. that are tricky to if it's estimate. gonna if it's over a pound i take my time i weigh it just so I know, okay, it's actually two pounds when I factor in there's going to be cardboard involved. Mm-hmm. Because I've had it before where I don't weigh it and I go, it's one pound. And then, you, and then by yeah. the time I put bubble mail in there and I have it in cardboard, it goes, oops, it's three pounds Yeah, you now. end up eating all the shipping, especially it, if it's breakable. Yeah. And um, so I, I factor that in right up front. And that's one of those items that almost everybody reselling even if you're doing it just for fun Mm -hmm. you need to have a scale and if you are new to reselling or you aren't sure if you want to stick with reselling and you're you really don't want to invest a lot of money Mm -hmm. most of us have some sort of scale in our house um i can tell you we my sister and i use one of three scales which sounds like insanity right but we have a we borrowed from my parents they already had like a three pound postal scale so all of our small stuff that's under three pounds is fine on that. We'll do that one. But we sometimes have things that are over three pounds, and if it's over three pounds, it basically just blocks it out. Like, it won't weigh it. So I've used, for mid, mid-range mid items, I've used our food scale. Mm. So we have a Taylor food scale, like, to measure flour or whatever. Um, it goes up to 11 pounds, so I've used that. But if I have something really crazy heavy that I know neither one of those will be suitable for, I will get on my body weight scale. I will stand on it, look at the number, and then pull on the thing, hold on the thing, and step on it again, and then just do some math, some civil subtra- subtraction to come up with that that number. So it's like weighing the dog. Yeah, out how yeah, heavy it's the same is. thing. So if you are in that position where where you don't, you're not sure if you want to keep reselling, or maybe you just found us through some of our thrift content and you want to just sell off a few things in your house, but you're not at all interested in like seriously becoming a reseller, um, look around your house. If you already have, like I said, a body weight scale, 
you can make it work. Yeah. Um, and it's it, chances are you probably know somebody that has another. If you're just shipping one or two items that won't work, you probably know somebody that has a scale that you can use. Um, but yeah, if you're going to be a, like a legitimate hardcore reseller, definitely invest in a scale. Look mm-hmm. around, see what, what you can find. And I wouldn't probably get one that if you're going to buy one, I would probably want one that goes up to at least 20 pounds unless yeah. you're routinely shipping heavy things. But I would say most smaller to mid size items are 20 pounds or less. Yeah, generally. So the scale I bought, I think I paid 27 bucks on Amazon mm-hmm. and it goes up to 50 pounds. Oh, nice. But nice. it's a small scale. So you have um, issues so, if it's awkward or large. Yeah, it, it's more like if it's anything bigger than the scale, it's weird positioning it mm-hmm. on it. To get to balance. To, yeah. And, or you and can't being able read, to the, read number. the numbers. I, I had hate one, that. I had one time I had to put the item up there. And then take my phone and actually take a picture of the number <laughs> because I couldn't see it. And, I hate that. But, you know, you make, like, I like what you said, though, especially for the hobbyist, make do with what you have mm-hmm. until you want to invest your money to get a little better at the mm-hmm. hobby. And, so. a gr- and like, if you do have something that's good enough, like, it's okay to have something that's good enough. It, mm-hmm. Not everything has to be ideal, yeah. especially not right off the bat. So if you have something that will suffice for the time, it would not be that hard to find one at an estate sale or a, a garage sale mm-hmm. or anywhere, really, um, secondhand later down the, the yeah. line, too. And I've seen them at the Goodwill, yeah, even. Yeah, and I've, and I've had times where I'm listing items and I'm able to get a general idea of what something is going to weigh, mm-hmm. um, especially if it's going to be around that five-pound range. I'll see what other people are charging for shipping mm-hmm. and I just use that as a number to generate, all right, I'm going to just charge X amount mm-hmm. and I won't worry exactly about how much my item weighs um, in relation to the item. Another thing to keep in mind are um, USPS does have flat rate boxes, yep. but the flat rate boxes are more expensive than if you were to ship it USPS ground. I think they're excellent if you have something that's small, Mm -hmm. but super heavy. Yeah. Because that weight will just knock your, it'll just make it go astronomical. And a lot of times if I have something awkward size or a little on the heavier end, I will end up shipping it UPS or FedEx instead. Um, But if you have something that's really compact, but it just, it's solid metal or something, those prepaid, like the priority flat rates are probably your way to go. Yeah. Because the the weight limit isn't as, is like particular yeah on those ones um so do you have any other tools of resale um anything interesting weird not that i can think of at the moment although i i do use rubbing alcohol a decent amount what do you use that for um I'll, it's kind of like your citrus off yeah citrus ball well i'm gonna botch that <laughs> but citrus solve. <laughs> I'll, I'll use, citrus solve i'll use it to rub off Okay. Labels mainly. Does it metal. work pretty good? It works okay. Um, I have found if you're using it on plastics that are not built for it, it will eat through the plastic. Yeah, this is a similar issue with the citrus all. That's why yeah. I said you have to really be careful. But it's great for hard items. But hard items, it, it takes it off. Um, I used it to clean up a bunch of eight tracks and had no problems. Um, so it, you make do with what you have. Um, another item I used. At least for a good while, I used sticky notes because I'll take a bunch of items and I don't, I don't recommend storing items this way, but I was taking my items and putting them directly into poly bags right after um, listing them mm-hmm. and then putting them into a tote and I would just put a sticky note on the outside of each one to, so I knew what it was. Yeah. But the problem with that, the sticky notes eventually fall off the poly bags. And then you end up like... <laughs> and then I had to go through and open up each one anyway. And that was just a huge mess. So that kind of brings like another... Oh, sorry, did I cut you off? No, no, no. Oh, that kind of brings in another tool of the trade. It may be super obvious. You need some sort of storage. Mm-hmm. Um, totes. Mm-hmm. We have shelving units. I think I've talked about the organizer that I picked up at an estate sale for $6. It was like a paper or a little booklet organizer. Um, those kinds of things are necessities mm-hmm. if you're going to resale and you don't want your entire house just to be an avalanche of crap. Yeah. So definitely figure out what works for you. What works for me may not work for you. 
um, what works for him may not work for me, um, but figure out your own organizational system. We're still fine tuning that. We recently went through our stuff and tried to like restack it in ways that made more sense. But as we grow, we probably will need to refine that. A label maker, mm -hmm. some of you might really want want and benefit from having some sort of label maker or at least a printer to you know like print little labels off. Um, but all these things are, are normal. Some of them you will just intuitively start using without thinking about it. But mm -hmm. hopefully we brought up a few things that will um, make your reselling life easier. We would love to hear if you have tools of reselling that we didn't think of. Maybe something that will make something easier, easier to clean, easier to package. Um, we have things like tape guns. So, like mm -hmm. we have a tape gun. Um, and... Of all, like we have a couple of different styles of tape gun. Those things are really handy, way easier than trying to pull out tape and, you know, and snip it clip with scissors it. Yeah. And, um, and even scissors. scissors it, yeah. It's something that I use on a regular basis that, or, or a box cutter. Mm -hmm. And it's something that you don't consider th these are my tools for my business. Mm -hmm. it, spend your business expenditures on your tools for your business. Yeah, we talked about this before. Um, the lighting setup that mm -hmm. we are using here for this. Uh, my sister uses... We initially got it so that my sister could have good lighting for our product photographs. Mm -hmm. Because lighting does matter when you want to get an ideal photograph. Mm -hmm. um, so things like that are tools of the trade too. Lighting, the kind of camera you're using. Or even Sheila. Sheila, our mannequin. <laughs> you have seen her before. Um, things like this are all tools... And the tools that you need will depend heavily on what you're selling um, and, and the type of person you are, just your, your personal preferences. So, but we would like to hear other suggestions. So pop those down in the comments for us. Um, maybe you can help other resellers or us improve our game. So did you have anything else to say on that? I think we're probably about done with our that, that's, reselling. That's pretty good. All right, I want, let's just go on to the next topic here. Yeah. This is kind of a fun one. So this, I'm going to say for this particular category, it can be something that you bought to resell, or it could just be for your personal, or maybe somebody you know. Hmm. So it could be for personal use, a gift, or just buy, picking up something you knew somebody needed, or for resale, what were your top thrift scores to date? Mm. And this is lifetime thrift. So, what 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 is oh. the, what are your top <laughs> the things that you were so like well blew your mind that you found? Oh, I think just based off of the past year. Um, so I went to a garage sale, and I mentioned it before. I have a lot of board game hobbies. Yep. Um, I play Expensive Dungeons. board games. Yeah, I play Dungeons and Dragons. I went to one garage sale and he had a whole bunch of Dungeons and Dragons books. And like yeah. modern books or like Yeah, they were fifth edition. Okay, and, so they were newer. But they right. there were also um a bunch of homebrew, um, third party publishing books like the Critical Role book. Interesting. Um he only had them marked at twelve bucks each. Pretty great price. Especially when the cheapest you can get them brand new. Um, through like Amazon during one of their flash mm -hmm. sales is like 20. So I picked up the few I needed just because I didn't have those books and I was like, that's a great price. Mm -hmm. And then I actually gave them my phone number. The guy who owned the books wasn't at the sale. I gave him my phone number. I'm like, hey, at the end of your garage sale, if you don't sell the rest of these, I'd love to pick them up. Mm -hmm. I'm really surprised that they were at the garage sale for the price that they were at. Well, that's the crazy Because D&D &D people... If you know anything about people in that sort of mm -hmm. nerd game realm, uh, board games or D and D games usually know the value of, of yeah. what they have, and they want to get full price. But maybe you just didn't like to sell stuff. It, I, I don't mean, know. They just need it, to clear out or something. It, they were selling a whole slew of random stuff, so I don't. I don't know. But I maybe he didn't like fifth edition <laughs> or just wanted to off it. <laughs> I, <laughs> for the amount of books he had, I I have no idea. But I gave him my phone number. I'm like, I'd love to get the rest mm -hmm. of them if you want to sell them, and. I ended up getting the rest of the books plus a bunch of like smaller modules and I only paid ninety dollars and when you broke it all down I paid like seven dollars a book. Nice. A a after after I already paid twelve dollars a book for the four that I wanted. Yeah. But it was such a great deal in savings that it got me a lot of extra copies. I'm able to give some stuff to people. Mm -hmm. 
or tell your friends that also play. Yeah, yeah, and with the extra, I'm some of them. One of the books um, that I paid twelve dollars initially for is like an eighty dollar book in itself, <sighs> used, and so it was just like. Well, just to FYI, I'm going to just sell that one. <laughs> not familiar with these books. A lot of them have high graphic value, so they have a lot of artist renderings in them. They're full color, um, which anyone who's even mildly familiar with printing mm-hmm. and books, full color, um, heavily like illustrated books are expensive, yeah. period. Because they're expensive to print, they're expensive to produce because you have to pay artists. Mm-hmm. So, And some of them are limited print runs, which he had okay, so that, a good six or seven of them. Which drives that value up. Yeah, that were um, third-party publishing, so they had only... Like, a run or like, something. Yeah, like 10,000 copies made or who knows what Interesting. Else. So... So did you sell any of them, or did you keep um, them all? Uh, keep so them far, they're enough? all sitting in the same tote I got them in. Okay. Just because I went through the ones I want to keep for sure. I put them with my own stuff. And then the ones that it's like, I know people who need books, and I just need to figure out who needs books and go, I paid basically nothing for this. Here you go. Mm-hmm. And give some people a few so books that they need. you just haven't like, dealt with them. I yet. just haven't gotten to them. So. All right. Interesting. How about you? What, what, are, what are some of your best... All right, my top all-time find, which sounds crazy, but I think it's going to be, I would love to top it. I would love to top it. It's going to be very hard for me to top it. I went to an estate sale. Um, It was, was it this year? It was probably earlier this year or into last year. I can't remember. I want to say it was earlier this year. Um, Yeah, it was. Because there was a couple, I picked up several good things at the state estate sale. You, you, have you heard me talk? If you've listened for any length of time, you've heard me talk about the hand blown Riedel wine glasses mm. that I purchased. That was this estate sale, but that was an excellent purchase, and that's that was one of my great finds. But it was not the best find that I got at that estate sale. I picked up three artist signed um, and numbered prints, mm. professionally framed, which. Again, if any you know anything about framing, if you've ever even tried to have something framed, it is insanely expensive to have something professionally framed. Um, and they were big. They're they're large prints. So I picked up three of them. Two of them were out of an ed- edition of fifty. So they were one. They were not number one, but one of fifty that were printed. Yeah. And one was <clears throat> out of thirty four. And. I saw them at the estate sale the first day. Caught my eye. And I came home and talk, talked to my husband and sister. And I think I had mentioned that they were kind of cool prints, you know. And I had gone to the estate sale in particular to find to look for a Zojirushi rice cooker. Which, I don't know if you guys know about that. Um, but the, it's a high-end. It's a Japanese rice cooker. Mm. So it's a high-end, really good quality rice cooker. And I saw on the estatesales.net, which if you're not using, you should be using... Um, that goes back to the tools of the trade. Yeah, that's the tool of the trade. Um, it's a great way to find estate sales. So I saw it on the picture, so I knew they had it. So this was one of my first sale that I showed up before the sale and got a number and waited in line to get to be one of the early people in the door for that rice cooker, um, which I did get, by the way, for $20. Way worth it. Even though it was an older model, it works great. Uh, another great find from that sale. That was a, It was a great estate sale. I have. It feels like I'm on a little tangent here, but it seems like when I go estate sailing, a lot of times, it's either really great or it's just like meh. So it's, that's how garage sales are oh too. Gosh. They're either wow, that right was, that was great, alley, yeah. or oh my gosh, why There's are they selling here. a box of open adult diapers? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So this was one of those sales that it was just great. Like there were so many things that were in my lane mm-hmm. and in my like point, of, like my viewpoint. Um, my search rate, on my radar, I guess would be the way to say it. So I got in line, saw that, and I saw these prints that first day. I didn't pick them up. They had them priced at $50 a piece, which it, it wasn't crazy, but I wasn't sure. Well, I went home and I am happened to Google Lens one of them. And I found it, and one that somebody was selling, it was actually on eBay. They were trying to sell it on eBay. Um, from the same edition, it was the same print that I had Google Lens. So I was able to find out the artist's name and, cause I couldn't read the signature. It was mm. one of those scribble signatures and yeah. I couldn't read it. Um, so I looked up the artist, I was reading, I was looking around and I, after I Google Lens, I was like, 
maybe I should have gotten those. Even because for me, I'm like, oh, 50 bucks a piece. Like it's 150 for all three. It's a big investment. Yeah. And and my mind, like I talked about in the last episode, I understand that art is expensive. Even if you buy it from an unknown artist, it just is. It's time. The art supplies, good quality art supplies, mm-hmm. paper, um, ink, things like that are expensive. And so it's an expensive thing to do. Yeah. Um, and and to, to have these already framed, like the frames themselves were probably worth the $50, but I was still just, I don't know, you know, I didn't know anything about them and I'm always leery with art because you don't know about value. So you, mm-hmm. I like to get it um, like cheaper unless it's something that really speaks to me. And I thought they were cool and I did, you know, I was thinking about them. So I went home, I Google lens it. I'm like, crap, I probably, I maybe should have gotten them after doing some research on the artist. And then I went back the next day, which was 25% off. They were all three still on the wall. Nice. Now they were thirty-seven fifty a piece. Yeah. I took all three, so one hundred and twelve dollars and fifty cents. A good deal. They're cool. They're pretty cool. We're gonna keep them for our personal collection. Um, one is actually you might have seen it. It's downstairs in my living room on the wall. Um. So I snagged them all for one twelve fifty. I picked up a couple more of those. Two more of those Rideau glasses while I was there because I always do another sweep. There are some estate sales that I will go back multiple times, uh, especially as things get cheaper because yeah. you just never know. And also, sometimes it's hard to, because you're often wandering through a whole house, It's sometimes you don't you miss stuff because yeah. it'll be tucked in a closet. Like the two other glasses I picked up on the 25% off day were up in a cupboard in a box mm-hmm. and I just didn't see them. And there, there are times I've been to sales where I grab a few things, I like it, and I go back another day. Like I'll go on Friday and I'll go back mm-hmm. on Sunday. And they're like, oh, yeah, we pulled out more stuff. Or our yeah. friend Bob came by with his stuff. And Dropped he, it off. And he's selling some more stuff. And so you never know. Yep. And especially with the estate sales, the wheeling and dealing really happens last day mm-hmm. when they want to clear out. So sometimes I'll go early if there's some stuff that I think is really cool or I want to just kind of take a peep at what's in there. Sometimes I'll buy a few things that I really like and then I'll come back last day to kind of see what's left and or if there was a piece that was priced higher than I wanted to pay and I'm like if it's still there the last day it'll be discounted and, and maybe I'll get it then so anyway to, to shorten this whole story um got them all took them home I started doing more reading on the artist I was looking up online um I found some galleries that were selling his prints still he's still alive um his name is Robert Stackhouse and I'll put a, a picture of like one of the prints up so you guys can kind of see his style um, but after doing some research and I was talking to my husband about it, we were looking, you know, looking at showing, I'm showing him some stuff. We've looked, looked it up. We determined, or we started to suspect that it might be worth getting a real appraisal for them, like an actual art appraisal. So we found a lady who wasn't too far from here. She's within an hour away. Um, and she had a thing on her website where you can, so instead of appraisers are very expensive, their per hour rate. Is like 150 an hour. I mean, they make decent money. But she had a good resume. I saw her resume. And on her website, she would let you submit photos of your items before you get the formal appraisal for a smaller fee. Oh, so nice. $20 for the first item and $10 for each subsequent item that you, you know, did in the lot. So it would have been $40. We're like, for $40, it's worth a shot to see if it's really worth getting appraised. Mm-hmm. So we put them in there. Yeah, she called us in. And so we ended up getting an insurance appraisal and getting it added onto our insurance. And it's not, it wasn't a life changing amount, but it was enough that the $37.50 was a really good price. Yeah. And so we ended up paying, I think, $4.75 when it was all said and done with the whole appraisal process. Um, but they were, as a collection, they were worth more than that more, and more than what I paid. So that's my top find to date. I would love to beat that. Yeah. And, and but, as it is with that, that's something that is just for yourself. Yeah. And even resale value alone, it doesn't matter. Like, it's yeah. cool that it's worth the amount of whatever that yeah. you got appraised for. But for the fact that you were able to find something that you loved and it was affordable mm-hmm. makes it worth going out to the estate sales more. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. It's because you just never know what you find. Mm-hmm. And so we have these sort of art pieces that... I mean, no one we know is going to have those. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not something that's just... for. I paid thirty seven fifty a piece. And like I said, they are big, professionally framed. You cannot find a wall, a piece of wall art at the TJ Maxx for that price. Yeah. 
You can't. Not that's big like that. And to have something that is an artist signed print is kind of cool. Like, it's just, it was so top fine. Really hard to beat, especially because they were a little bit higher value. Uh, and I didn't pay much for them. <laughs> so yeah. it was funny because we went to the appraiser. We told her how much I paid. And she was like, <laughs> like <laughs> she made some like <laughs> kind of sound. So we're like, yeah, okay, cool. That was even before she like got gave the report. And it was a cool process too to to actually get to see what it's like to have something appraised. Mm. Because um, she also does antiques and jewelry and, and things. So it was interesting to sort of go go through that process. And she was super nice. I would recommend her to anybody. Um, but just kind of, you know, see what it's like to have an appraisal, get that report back, see what they say. Um, yeah, it was neat. So cool. what else would, I mentioned several of my <laughs> great, but that was a really good estate sale. Um, but <laughs> guy had excellent taste. Um, what about you? What else do you have? I really can't think of anything. So the D and D were your your top. Uh, that that's just the top for my own personal find, uh-huh. I guess. Um, I found a uh, two sealed Palm Pilots from two thousand six. I think whatever. you mentioned these. On yeah, the I episodes. I think I did, yeah. and I I made a hundred and fifty bucks off of yeah, one it's of them. Really nice. And I still have the other one. And you said it sold fast. Too. It sold really fast. And you paid like two bucks or something. Yeah, I paid two dollars for it and it sold within like two days. Which basically covered the price of the other one too, so. Oh, it more than covered the price. (laughs) (laughs) Had it sold for twenty dollars even for the two dollars. I would have been happy, but. I mean, that would be still be a really nice profit. Right, right. And so, um, I've, I've had a few other items where it's been like, I only paid five bucks for it and it sold for 50 or so. Yeah, I've had several of the glasses. But. um, The wine glasses that I talked about several times. Um, Mm -hmm. A spittoon that showed up in that sold really well. Mm -hmm. Didn't pay a lot for. So I've had a few things like that. Um, But one thing I showed you today and my sister bought it off me. So it's a not not for sale. I'm not keeping it, but she's going to keep it. Is at the Goodwill. The local Goodwill, I found a stat, an Egyptian cat statue. It's like a, a Bast, if you know who the goddess Bast is or Bastet. Um, it is bronze on a base, and it's from the Metropolitan Museum of Art store. So, like, they sell replicas and stuff. And I think this one might be an older, like, a vintage model. But if you look up on their website today, they sell almost the same cat. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's very very similar and it's super cool in fact we should get a picture we'll get of that, a picture for the of that too <laughs> and i paid 24.99 plus michigan taxes um so i wasn't it was 25 dollars yeah. and change 26 dollars, whatever um and on the metropolitan if you got the modern version it would be i think it was 345 if you're not a Me- metropolitan museum member mm-hmm. to get the statue uh, my sister weighed it i think it's like 17, 18, between 17 and 18 pounds. So it's hefty. <laughs> and it was just sitting on the Goodwill shelf and I picked it up. I'm like, whoa, this is real. Like I could tell you can, especially the longer you're in the sort of thrifting game or just maybe you have an intuitive, some people have an intuitive sense for quality, but you start to like pick up on the, the hallmarks of what makes this some like cheap decor piece versus a high quality item. Mm-hmm. And you picked it up. Hefty. Yeah. So I knew that it was real metal, and which automatically means it had inherent value. Mm-hmm. Anything bronze, copper, brass. And, and that's one inherent. of those things. You saw it. It spoke to you. It was unique enough where yeah. you said, oh my gosh, what in the world is that? <laughs> and my sister, since she was little, has had an interest in ancient Egypt. Mm. So I, I was like, it was one of those things like, I'm in the store, I pick it up, and I put it back. I'm thinking, I can't leave it here. Yeah. I was like, I might, in my head, I was like, I might end up returning it. But I can't not get it. Mm-hmm. Can't not get it. Actually, I had a weird find like that at the same Goodwill. I bet. Um, oh, probably. So. And I didn't have my phone. Oh, I didn't have my phone either, so I couldn't oh, do really? a comp. Uh, I was just going on what it was like. But I, so I knew at home. I was like, I have to at least take it home. But anyway, so the I, same Goodwill. It's the, a great Goodwill. I found this weird bowl. It, it's massive. It's on this pedestal and it's ornate. And it has these carvings of, like, elephants on it. It's super bizarre. Like a decorative urn kind of thing? No, because it's just, like, a decorative bowl. Oh, like a bowl. bowl. It's massive. It probably stands about a good foot tall. 
and it's about eight inches wide, but the rim of the bowl is like two inches wide. And so it's big. It's really weird. We couldn't figure out what in the world it was. We Google lensed it. Turns out it's supposed to have a topper that goes over mm-hmm. top. If it has that extra piece, one of them was selling on Etsy for $600. What was it? I don't know. It's some like garden bowl that you're supposed to put outside and, and yeah, I don't know, but it didn't have the topper. Oh, dang. And we could, we could see that one of the legs was like loose basically mm-hmm. or had a crack in it or something. What was it made out of? It, it's made out of like some type of metal. It's heavy. Really? Yeah. It was really weird. But they only had like $8 on it, and I was like, it's too cool to pass up. I haven't listed it, because I actually took it and put it in our own stuff, because it was like, this is really cool. Uh-huh. We, we like it. What are you going to use it for? <laughs> we don't know. We haven't gotten that far. Candle. But right, right now, it, <laughs> yeah, that, that would be actually a really good use for it. But um, right now, we got it sitting in the garage, because it was like, eh, this is super cool, but we just don't have the space for it in an apartment right this moment. So Yeah. I think... And I think the nice thing, too, about our Goodwill, and I kind of alluded to that, but our Goodwill allows returns. Mm-hmm. Not all thrift stores allow returns, so be aware. Be mindful of that when you're outsourcing or when you're mm-hmm. thrifting for yourself. And estate sales, obviously, you can't return. Um, but the good thing about our Goodwill is it allows returns. Mm-hmm. And one thing that gave me pause when I got the cat was it's 25 bucks. Like, that's high for me to buy something at a, at a, mm-hmm. a thrift shop. But it was just, like you said, it was too cool to leave it. Yeah. And it felt legit. Like the bowl felt legit. Um, I'm so curious what brand it was or what the purpose was. I can't or... even remember. This was a this was back in the spring when I found it too. <sighs> I'll have to um I wonder dredge if it they out. lost the lid or if it's somewhere if it was somewhere at the Goodwill. I looked for a while. I actually went back to that Goodwill like three more times within the next week looking for the lid never did and I it. never did Maybe that's why it. they got rid of it. That could be. Maybe it got bent or something. But, but. Um, but yeah, I think, so be mindful of the return policies because if you can return, mm-hmm. like I think if we have a week at our good, our area Goodwills. I think, I think it's the one week. I think it's all the ones in the region yeah. are, are a week. Um, that also buys you a little bit of thinking time. Mm-hmm. If you see something that's unique you've never seen before or like me I couldn't pull a comp I couldn't identify where this thing came from I didn't find out that it came from that it was a replica from the the museum store until I got home and was able to google lens it and find it um and a lot of famous museums sell similar kind of statues too um the I know the Louvre has one that's a copy from their collection Mm. so but that that particular statue is like isn't something that I'm always picking I'm not always I'm not a statue dealer, you know? <laughs> you don't have your eyes out for cat statues? How dare you? <laughs> not in particular. I mean, statues, sure. But not... I, I don't deal in statues or, or what have you, you yeah. know? Um, and so I think that's also... Especially in a place that has a good return policy. Mm-hmm. You can get it and think about it. If you're not sure if it'll sell. If you're not sure you want it for yourself. If you're not sure the person you bought it for will want it because I didn't know wasn't one hundred percent sure if my sister wanted it, um, and she wasn't home when I when I found out what it was. Um, she did very shortly, like that same evening. She decided she was gonna buy it and sent me the money for it. I just charged her what I paid, um, but I would have probably sold it because yeah. I probably could have gotten one fifty to two hundred off of that because it was a very good quality statue. It would have cost a fortune. It would have been a pain in the rear to, sh- to ship anywhere. But that's but... what UPS is Yeah. For. <laughs> and very sturdy boxes. Yeah. Um, but even if it's not something that is your niche in particular, we've kind of touched on this in previous episodes. Do you remember which one we talked about that? Like what um, our niche is? It was a couple episodes ago. I want to say it was two episodes ago. A couple episodes ago. Yeah. Um, we, you want to just be open to what's there. Mm-hmm. And... Maybe it's a little odd. Maybe it's interesting. And sometimes it's those interesting things that are really the things you want to pick up. Yeah. Because you, you've you got to have your realm of understanding, which we touched on in that episode. Mm-hmm. But it's it doesn't hurt you to invest a little bit and stretch out. Mm-hmm. Like, had I seen that statue, mm-hmm. I might not have thought, that's going to be money. Mm-hmm. I might have looked at it and gone, oh, that's weird and heavy. I'm going to skip it. But... 
had a having that uh, that eye for open opportunities will lead you to better financial gain. Yeah, and sometimes it's just a matter of if something catches your eye because it's unusual, mm-hmm. pick it up, look at it, yeah. see if it's marked. And you don't um, you don't have up. to pick up you don't have to buy everything you touch. No, but you can pick <laughs> it up and look at it. <laughs> yeah, you know. And that's the nice part about going to the thrift store. Being able to just grab things and go, eh, oh, oh, it's broken, and put it yeah. back because I it, didn't realize it that hurt. that exactly what that cat statue was made out of until I picked it up mm-hmm. because we it, there are so many things that are faked, so porcelain that's made to look like metal yeah. or resin that's made to look like metal. Mm-hmm. Um, it's some one of those things that you really need to pick up and just you need to feel it and look at it. Yeah. And um, same with art, you have to examine it. To see if it is this really a signed print or is this a print of a print, mm-hmm. which are two very different things. And I happen to have a little bit of knowledge in art. And like like I said, my sister's interested in Egypt. So that pinged on my radar. Boom. You know, and she likes little, she likes statues and stuff. She recently bought a, a statue of Nike, the, the head, headless winged like goddess yeah. um, at an estate sale. So... That's actually an interesting topic, which we haven't really covered, but, and maybe we should, uh, let us know if you, if you would like to hear us talk a little bit more about it, but your own background and your personality really plays into reselling. Mm-hmm. And I think you can use that to your, to your advantage. Yeah. You have strengths that I don't, you probably know things about this sort of board game realm that I don't, that you can look at it and immediately know that's a good game. Mm-hmm. That's a cool game. I've heard of that game. And I might I might look it up. I might know that, oh, it's got high graphic value. Maybe it's a fancy board game. But I may not know right off the, off the top of my head. You know? Same thing with, I might go to a sale and go, oh my gosh, there's a whole lot of wine glasses. But I'm going to yeah. walk past them because they're fragile to ship when really I should be picking them up. Yeah, and looking so. for, for mar- maker's marks. Yeah. And keeping your, I think you should use your personality and your your background and knowledge areas to your advantage for sure, but kind of to piggyback on what we're talking about, keep, be open to the things that you aren't familiar with. Mm-hmm. Pick it up anyway. Look at it. Look up that brand. I'm always learning new brands. Mm-hmm. I I just learned recently about these books called the it's from the Folio Society F O L I O Society, and they make expensive high-end, ornate books, volumes of books. Usually they come with their own case and they'll have like, you know, like gilded lettering and stuff on the bindings. They'll have illustrations. They're high-end, high-quality books. And as it turns out, they have a high resale value. Mm -hmm. Um, Or if you're a book collector, you might just want to be looking out for them at thrift stores, estate sales, um, garage sales. For your own collection because they are they're beautiful and would look great lined up on a bookshelf. So I didn't know about those books until this weekend. And it's weird because I saw them at an estate sale and so I looked it up and then I found out and then we had friends over yesterday and he brought them up. Oh really? Because That's weird. He I think he's he's a little he's he's a computer guy and has a decent income. He I think has bought them before. Mm. Because they were attractive and good quality. Um, and I think they're, they are they vary in subject matter, too. So they're not all the same subject. Um, but, yeah, he brought that up this weekend. And we did end up... I went back to the estate sale the last day, which was today, this afternoon, before... Um, actually, before you came over to record this. And we picked them up. I got a set of them for $15. They come with the case. It The case is a little damaged. Um, but 15 bucks for... I think it was a set of... I think five or five. six, yeah. five, um, yeah, of really expensive books. So, so Folio Society, and always be open. Play off of your knowledge, your strength, but be willing to learn more. Mm-hmm. So, which if you're listening to the podcast, you're probably willing to do. <laughs> yeah, and we would love, we would love to hear about your top thrift finds too, whether it was personal or or professional. Um, I know for a fact, just from my own thrifting, that there are so many cool things out in the world, mm-hmm. and we'd love to see what, or we'd love to see and or hear about what you guys found. Yeah. So go ahead and let us know down in the comments below, 
And while you're down there, please hit like and maybe subscribe if you want to learn more on the Secondhand Sellers Podcast. Please like and subscribe. (laughs) Have a great day. Thank you for joining us again. We'll be here next week with another episode of Secondhand Sellers. See ya.